Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order of the State Government Finance and Elections Committee. And pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Today is February 3rd, 2022. Um, the committee administrator, or the, excuse me, the committee of legislative assistance will take the role. Thank you. Chair Nelson. I'm here. Chair Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson is present. Carlson is present. Representative Nash. Nash present. Representative Nash is present. Representative Bonner. Bonner present. Representative Bonner is present. Representative Dreskowski. Present. Representative Dreskowski is present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Representative Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Greenman present. Representative Greenman is present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn present. Representative Cleborn is present. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick present. Representative Kosnick is present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Representative Mason is present. Representative New Brindley. Present. Representative New Brindley is present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. Present. Representative Quam is present. Chair Nelson with that, a quorum is present. Thank you, um, Benji. Um, the next thing on the agenda is uh, the approval of the minutes from the meeting on February 1st. I hope everyone's had a chance to look at those. Uh, Representative Claiborne, you want to move the minutes? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, please. Uh, I move the minutes um, for February 5th to be approved, or February 1st to be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all, all in favor, if you want to mute, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The minutes are approved. Uh, this morning's meeting, members, is going to be a presentation from the National Conference of State Legislators on cybersecurity broadband provisions that are in the Federal Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act. Um, with us today, we have Susan Frederick from the NCSL, and we have Trey York from the NCSL. Um, who's going to start out? And there's a, um, it was in the packet also, but there's a, uh, um, a PowerPoint that they have. So um, Susan, are you gonna start or is Trey gonna start? Uh, I think our slides go in the order of Trace and then me. So uh, just for ease of facilitation, let's have Trace begin. Sounds good. Welcome to the committee, Trey. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen and then I'll introduce myself and Susan real quick. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. It's up okay. on our screen. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, my colleague and Susan and I are with the National Conference for State Legislatures, uh, a bipartisan organization that represents every state legislator and legislative staff in the country. Uh, my name is Trace York, and I'm the Associate Legislative Director for our Communications, Financial Services, and Interstate Commerce Committee, and I'm joined by my colleague Susan Frederick, uh, Senior Federal Affairs Counsel on our Law and Criminal Justice Committee, and we are both based in NCSL's Washington, D.C. office. So I'm going to kick things off uh, with the broadband provisions. Um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provided $65 billion in new federal funding for broadband infrastructure and establishes, establishes uh, new programs that direct funding toward broadband deployment and affordability. The most significant funding in the program that I'll focus most on today uh, is allocated for a program called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, which I'll call BEAD from now on. Uh, that will be administered by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which I will refer to from here on out as NTIA, the federal government loves acronyms. Um, and NTIA is an agency within the Department of Commerce. So 
The Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program is a program that through formula-based grants will distribute about $42.5 billion in broadband funding to the states. The states in turn would then um, competitively award grants um, to support broadband infrastructure and mapping and deployment. So the application process is still very fluid at this point, and we'll be getting updated guidance from NTIA in the coming months. But right now, this is what we know. So NTIA must issue a notice of funding opportunity for the program within 180 days of the bill's enactment. So that's six months, and that would fall on May 15th, uh, 2022 of this year. So in my conversations with the Commerce Department, they do expect it to take pretty much the entire six months before the notice is available. So we should anticipate about May of this year um, for the, the notice of funding opportunity to be public. But when it is, that notice will basically establish the process that states will have to go through to apply for funding um, by submitting a letter of intent, as well as an initial proposal and eventually a final proposal explaining the state's plan on using the funds based on a variety of templates that will be provided by the NTIA, so nobody should be flying completely blind. So what funding will be available through this program? Um, the law basically designates three different pots. The first pot of money is worth a little over $5 billion and is simply the minimum allotment that all states uh, and, and US territories will receive. That minimum is $100 million. So every single state um, and in certain US ter territories will, will receive $100 million. No questions asked, no application needed. Uh, once this program is up and fully fully running. The second category of funding is specifically for high cost funding, and it's a little over $4 billion. And that funding will essentially be allocated for broadband projects based on um, unserved locations in high cost areas in each state. And that will be determined by NTIA based on a variety of factors, um, such as poverty, geographic uh, remoteness, low population density, and a variety of other metrics. The third and largest category is for unserved area funding, which totals a little over $32 billion. And that would be allocated for broadband projects based on unserved locations in each state. And the definition of unserved in the law is any areas that are lacking 25 download and three upload megabits per second uh, broadband coverage, which is... <laughs> for all intents and purposes, essentially not. Um, once the state's application is accepted, NTIA will allocate the high cost and unserved funding to states based on a number of different formulas, but basically what it does is it will, they'll compare the number of high cost and unserved areas in a given state against what the national average is. That's a little simplistic, but that's pretty much the general idea behind it. Another thing that I should mention is that while states will be the entities receiving the funding directly from the federal government, the program does require a substantial amount of coordination by the state with local governments in, the, in their state, as well as various regional entities. So for example, each state will be required to um, submit a five-year action plan uh, to the NTIA, and that plan must be a collaboration with local governments. And essentially what the plan will do is state where the, uh, you know, the areas of, of the area where there is no coverage is in their state, you know, what um, subgrantee uh, could be receiving the funding, how much the funding would be, what the project specifically would be for, and so on and so forth. One other important thing to mention is that there is a matching requirement for the program, uh, which is that a state must provide or must require a subgrantee receiving the funds to provide a matching contribution that is equal to at least 25% of project costs. Now, in general, the match must come from non-federal funds, although the NTIA can waive the matching requirement for certain high cost areas. And additionally, this is really important, the BEAD program specifically permits the use of federal matching funds if they were provided to a state um, under any of the, of the recent COVID-19 relief laws. So including the CARES Act, um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, and most recently the 
American Rescue Plan or ARPA. Um, so those funds that the state received um, can be used for the matching requirement. And there's also no restriction on the type of entity that may provide the match as well. The last thing that I'll mention uh, about the BEAD program is that this program is essentially, at least to get it kicked off, entirely contingent on one very important thing, which is that the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC uh, has to release their new broadband data maps. They've been working to establish new nationwide broadband maps to more accurately determine where coverage is lacking in every state. Um, most people that I've spoken to uh, don't anticipate those maps being available until well into this year. And the B program cannot allocate funding, not even the, the 100 million minimum allotment until those maps are completely done. So this means that it's unlikely that states will see funding from the BEAD program probably until towards the end of this year, maybe early 2023. It really just depends on how quickly the FCC can finish wrapping up, getting those maps developed so that states have a really good, clear picture of where the funding is needed. So I'm gonna to touch on a few other broadband programs that were in the law and then turn things over to Susan. So uh, the infrastructure law also expanded a current FCC program. It was called the Emergency Broadband Benefit and they renamed it the Affordable Connectivity Program and it was allocated $14.2 billion. The program basically provides a monthly subsidy for low income families to purchase any internet service of their choosing without having to submit to credit checks. And it requires uh, participating providers to kind of like carry out a public awareness campaign to promote the program and so forth. Uh, it is important to note that the monthly benefit is actually reduced from $50 a month down to $30 a month. But the FCC did launch that program at the beginning of this year. And so, enroll, so any citizens that match a certain uh, requirement um, can enroll in that program uh, through the FCC's website right now. The infrastructure law also included uh, $2.75 billion in funding under the Digital Equity Act of 2021 to create different grant programs uh, that will be administered by the NTIA to help promote digital inclusion and help in individuals fully benefit from uh, the digital economy. So low income households, uh, veterans, rural inhabitants, um, the elderly, individuals with disabilities and others are kind of the populations that are, that are specifically targeted uh, through these grants. So the first grant is a state digital equity planning grant. It was allocated about $60 million for states to specifically develop digital equity plans. A lot of states have already done that and have done good work on it so far. Uh, but that, but this money would help uh, any states that haven't so far kind of develop those initial plans. And applications are expected uh, to open in the second quarter of this year for that grant. The second grant is the State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program, which dedicates uh, about $1.44 billion for states, um, which will be distributed through annual grant programs over a five-year period to implement uh, digital equity projects and support the implementation of the digital equity plans. And these uses can include things like uh, digital literacy efforts, uh, broadband adoption, tech, tech support, and a variety of other things. It's unclear at this point when these grants will be available, uh, but hopefully sometime by the latter part of this year. The third grant is the Digital Equity Competitive Grant Program, uh, which was allocated about $1.25 billion in discretionary grant. Uh, it's a discretionary grant program uh, that will be distributed uh, via annual grant over five years uh, to implement digital equity pro projects. Uh, these grants are competitive and given to different types of entities than the previous grant, which was more directed towards states. So uh, some of those entities include specific types of political subdivisions or agencies or instrumentalities of a state. It could include tribal governments. Uh, it could include nonprofits, uh, community anchor institutions like schools or libraries or hospitals. 
uh, um, local educational agencies and so on and so forth. And again, not entirely sure when that program will be available, but I would guess the second or third quarter of this year. The last program that I'll mention uh, was a $1 billion grant program that NTIA will administer for the construction and improvement of middle mile infrastructure on a competitive basis to various eligible entities. And the purpose of the grant program is to expand and extend middle mile infrastructure to reduce the cost of connecting unserved and underserved areas to uh, basically like the internet backbone. And the types of entities that can receive these grants is a vast, uh, vast list of entities, states, counties, cities, tribal governments, um, electric cooperatives, public utility districts, uh, nonprofits, telecommunications companies. I mean, the, the list is very, very long. And the last thing I'll mention about this is that the amount of a middle mile grant to an eligible entity cannot exceed 70% of the total project cost. Um, so the anticipated opening of this program is most likely in the second quarter of this year, somewhere between April and June. Um, and so we'll see how quickly that can get rolled out. So that was a detailed and very fast overview of the broadband programs. And we'll continue to engage with our federal partners as each program becomes available. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Susan to talk about the cybersecurity provisions. Thanks, Trace. And thank you, Chair Nelson and Vice Chair Carlson, also members of the State Government Finance and Elections <coughs> Committee for inviting us here this morning. Um, and Susan, really if you want to identify yourself for the tape. Oh, sure. My name is Susan Frederick. I am Senior Federal Affairs Counsel for NCSL. And I staff our Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee. I also staff our Cybersecurity Task Force. So the cybersecurity grant is impactful for the very basic reason that it is the first dedicated cyber grant to states ever. Um, it's $1 billion over four years. And as you can see in the slide, 80% um, of that is a pass through to local governments. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but the money, the way it will flow is the dollars will be appropriated to FEMA, uh, who will then disperse to the states. Uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, is the subject matter expert and will review all of the submissions from the states to determine whether they meet the requirements of the law. So the 80% pass through to local governments, 25% of that must go to rural communities and multi-entity grants can be made to groups of eligible entities. So NCSL has joined with the Homeland Security Advisors represented by the National Governors Association, the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, or NACIO, and the National Emergency Management Association, NEMA, uh, to discuss how to move forward with this grant in terms of guidelines uh, we've been talking to CISA and to FEMA about what might work best for states. And, you know, one of the things that we know CISA and FEMA are considering uh, as they work on the guidance language is that um, the grant money will probably be distributed to the state homeland security advisors. And then CISA is also considering projects that states undertake that would benefit localities um, that could be then considered as part of that 80% pass-through. So if you've got joint projects with locals and states, uh, that could be as, as CISA and FEMA develop this guidance language, and we've, we've asked for this, that that be considered part of that 80%. Um, we won't know until the guidance language actually comes out, however, so um, keep that in your back pocket for now. Um, Eligible uses of the funds are what you might expect, uh, developing, revising, and implementing cyber plans. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. If you've got a state cybersecurity plan and, and you've been implementing it, you really just need to make sure that um, it, it meets the requirements of the, of the law. And there's 16 specific requirements contained in the law. I'm not going to list them here for you. If you uh, want them, I'll give them to you uh, after the hearing. But, uh, you know, so developing, revising, and implementing your cyber plan, addressing cyber threats and the funding of any other appropriate activity, 
as determined by the Secretary of Homeland Security. So those are the eligible uses of the funds. The prohibited uses, you can see on the slide, you can't pay ransomware attacks with the money. Um, you can't supplant state, local, and territorial funding. Um, so if you allocated money at the state level for a project, you can't uh, use federal dollars instead. This would be in addition to. Uh, there's a recipient cost sharing contribution that's prohibited and any non-cyber purpose, which makes um, sense. So another requirement of this grant is that you establish a planning committee, which includes representatives from localities, public health, public education, et cetera, and, and those who are, are experts in IT and cybersecurity. And in fact, there is a 50% requirement of, of this planning committee. 50% of the members must have professional experience in cybersecurity or IT. And again, if you have an existing committee or work group that you've already formed that has the required um, staffing needed under the law, you're good. Um, the cyber plan, as I mentioned, has 16 specific elements that include um, an assessment of your cyber capabilities in your state, a description of state and local roles that you anticipate um, using, and resources and a timeline. So those are the basic requirements. And then in discussions with both FEMA and CISA, here's how the agencies are hoping this is going to work. So initially, um, they, will, they are holding stakeholder conversations, and those have probably started to wrap up, if not already wrapped up. They did most of this during uh, the latter half of December and into January. So now they're going to be hopefully developing their FY22 notice of funding opportunity. And then while they are doing that, states should be working with localities to develop their plans and projects. The state planning committees and CISOs or CIOs should be approving those plans. And then the state administrative, state administrative agency or SAA submits that package to FEMA. FEMA will review for statutory compliance and CISA will review for content to make sure that it um, meets the requirements of the grant as well. FEMA will actually be distributing the funds and then the states can make sub awards and report outcomes as required by the law. And then after that, they will go forward with FY23 notice of funding um, at the federal level as well. With respect to a timeline, um, it's all very, uh, fluid at the moment is the best way to describe it. And I'll tell you why there's, there's a little bit of a snag and it may, I hope it's just a little bit of a snag, but this grant is because it is a new grant, it doesn't tack onto an existing program. It is subject to the Paperwork Reduction Act, which is a rather old federal law. I think it was enacted around 1980 and it requires that an agency that is seeking to collect certain information from the public, and I guess your state, your locals are considered the public for this, uh, for purposes of this law. Um, there's an application process and there's an approval process that then has to go through the Office of Management and Budget. Um, FEMA, I think uh, we have been reassured that the folks at FEMA are very used to dealing with this and have are trying to do a workaround um, the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act in order to um, expedite the grant making process. So one of the things that they are looking at is whether or not the information that they're seeking to collect, which is the reporting requirements that the states will have to provide to the agency as a part of the grant, uh, can be deemed intelligence information and therefore exempt from the Paperwork Reduction Act. So we're waiting a final word on that, but otherwise, you know, that is the, the story um, of this brand new grant and we hope it will be helpful to you all at the state level. Um, I would encourage you that, you know, if you've got questions or you have uh, unique uh, situations in your state that you get with your CISO, that you meet with your emergency manager and you try to, co you know, collaborate a bit on some of those issues. But I'm happy to answer questions about the new law and about this new grant. Thanks so much. So the last uh, slide that we have here, 
um, is kind of our infrastructure team. Uh, Susan and I obviously do broadband and cyber, but we do have some other staff in our DC office that covers some of the other uh, areas in the infrastructure law. So I did want to provide their email addresses uh, and kind of put a name to a to an issue area. So um, if anyone is interested or has questions about some of those other areas, you can reach out to them directly or you can go through Susan and I and we're happy to do that. So that is our uh, presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen here. And um, yeah, thank you so much and happy to try to answer any questions. Okay, and, uh, and uh, those 16 points uh, document that you were talking about, Susan, if you could uh, email that to us, um, either myself or myself and my uh, Amanda, my uh, committee assistant, that way we can make it available to anybody else on the committee that might wanna see the full list of those requirements. Absolutely. And I've got a couple of hands up here for questions. I'll start with Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Susan, it's uh, nice to hear you. Uh, we serve on the same task force, the Cybersecurity Task Force. I'm the, one of the Minnesota members. And I guess my question for both grants that have been spoken about, um, I'm trying to understand what the, we'll pick the state of Minnesota for this example, what the state of Minnesota's role in the handling of money and the oversight of money and what latitudes, and I, I hope very few, that the state has in uh, siphoning off money from these grants to administer them, because it's been one of my long-standing gripes that uh, the state, the state takes too much money out of grants um, to administer them. So if you could maybe add some insight, and it, there may not be any at this point, but if you could add some insight into how that is going to roll out, I would be greatly uh, appreciative about that. And then talk about, um, in the second question is, what are the standards that will have to be met by grantees? So do they have to follow the NIST standards and, and others? Is that part of the granting requirements that have been put out? Um, you know, as somebody who works in cybersecurity, we try to make sure that everybody is speaking the same language and that they are all on the same page before they deploy whatever technology improvements and security improvements they're going to be making. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Frederick. Yeah, I can take that. Hi, Rep. Nash. It's so nice to, to well, to hear you. <laughs> anyway, uh, I can answer um, the question. I can answer both your questions with respect to the cybersecurity grant. Um, the law, the, the grant in, in the law, the language actually limits the amount that can be spent on administrative costs to 5% of your grant amount. So no more than 5% of your grant can actually be used for grant administration. Um, in terms of where the money is gonna go, my sense, and I don't have a definitive answer, so I'm gonna caveat this to death, but my understanding from where I think um, FEMA and CISA are going with you know, who will actually administer the money, it sounds like that it will go through the Homeland Security Advisors in your state. And, and it may be the state, uh, it, it may change. I don't know that it will. Um, so that's a big fat maybe, <laughs> but I, that, that's what I've heard um, in discussions with uh, the agencies. And then, you know, the other piece of this I wanna just throw out there, our main ask of this grant um, structure was that it be as flexible as possible for states so that, you know, if you've got a, a project in your state that has to be done that may not be applicable to 25 other states in the country, for example, um, that there be flexibility sort of implied and, and baked into the approval process for the fund so that you would be able to do whatever project you would need to do in your state. Um, as far as the NIST guidelines go, the NIST standard, there's no actual requirement that you follow those, um, but I'm not really sure if there's anything out there that really is as comprehensive or as, um, you know, part of the way of doing business these days that isn't part of the NIST framework. So even though it's not specifically mentioned, I think most places are using NIST at this point. 
so I, I would say, you know, your a safe bet is to, you know, if you're using this framework to continue in that vein. I hope that hopefully answers some of your questions. Representative Nash. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Susan, thank you for that. Um, I guess my reservations will continue uh, and that I'd like to also see this perhaps go through the newly created uh, Minnesota Cybersecurity Task Force, or um, yeah, Task Force that we have. Uh, it's the committee that we have created uh, that brings legislators of both sides of the aisle together. We'll eventually have uh, security clearances and that they or we, since I serve on that, may have an insight into that because really, whether it's federal money or state money, it's all citizens money and we have to be good stewards of that. And I wanna make sure that we're providing some level of oversight into how we spend money in the name of security. Because as uh, those of us that are in the profession know, you can spend money in the name of security on a lot of things that don't provide any security. So I just wanted to make sure that we're not um, running around um, throwing throwing candy to the crowds like we do in parades uh, in the hopes of it fixing something. So if you could maybe detail that just a little bit more. Ms. Frederick. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're on the right track for sure, Rep Nash. I think that part of the, you know, what they tried to do with this grant language was to make sure that what you intend to use it for actually benefits state security and local security, which is why I think they're requiring this planning committee with at least half of the members having professional experience in cybersecurity or information technology. Um, they want to make sure all sectors are represented and that you're not kind of operating in a vacuum. And I would assume that a bipartisan committee, you know, a bipartisan legislative committee in your, in your state would be very helpful in making sure that, you know, you're not, as you would say, throwing candy in a, at a parade. <laughs> um, but I do, I do think that the agency, um, both FEMA and, and CISA, want to make sure that the money is being used appropriately for actual valid cybersecurity purposes. And I will, um, you know, I will tell you the 16, you know, categories of, of appropriate use I think help in that regard. Um, you know, nobody wants to be singled out as, you know, buying quote unquote toys for their technology folks that don't really help uh, in a larger capacity. And uh, Ms. Frederick, we've has, we have quite a few members on this committee that have extensive IT background and knowledge. So um, um, it's, we're, we're fortunate here. I'm, Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. I might be considered one of the Luddites on the committee. Um, <laughs> Representative Kwam, you had your hand up earlier. Represent, Representative Nash, are you done? Um, I, I am. I'll just say for the record that I believe uh, when these funds begin flowing, we really need legislative oversight for every nickel just because we, um, we are the ones that are also dealing with other funds that are going out to uh, to do some of the same things and I think that I don't want to uh, allow this to, to to get spent foolishly so I want to make sure that we're providing that level of oversight thank you mr. chair thank you representative Nash and I fully agree with what you're saying representative Kwam you had your hand up then you took it down and you got it back up so you got a question uh, yes uh, first I want to say that we may want to look as a committee of engaging the LAC in order to uh, um, specify a little bit more precisely some of the auditing. But my question, I was just curious because of all of the uh, bad actors uh, in cyber now, um, how detailed is the public release of the plans we submit. Uh, I don't want to give too much easy research to the bad actors of how the state of Minnesota is doing it. So it'd be nice to understand the uh, uh, security clearance level rest of the story. Is it a very high level that's uh, publicly available or is it uh, somewhat more detailed? Ms. Frederick that or Mr. York? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I unfortunately don't have an answer. That has been raised with the agency because of this, um, you know, if we can, if, if FEMA is successful in designating this information that you need to report back or submit um, as intelligence information, then I don't know that it would have public disclosure. I think it might be exempt at least or redacted or something. I don't know. Um, but that's a really good question. And I, I would be happy to take that back to the agencies uh, and get you an answer, a, a specific answer. Representative Kwam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for uh, that clear. It, it, it'd be nice to, to know that because, um, yeah, it, it it's a concern of how, how easy we make it for them to uh, know what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Kwam. Uh, Representative Bonner, another yeah. one of our IT people. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Nelson. Um, well, a couple of really quick things. Um, Trey, I wonder if you, we walked through um, a number of the issues around broadband and particularly some of the grants and timeline items really, really quickly. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I'm not that quick uh, with the note taking. Um, certainly, I, I did catch some of the highlights and I've heard some of the pieces before, but if you have, um, some real simple like one pagers on the three grants that you mentioned and some some sort of rough idea of the timelines uh for for the larger piece that's a little bit new to us uh, i think that would be really helpful uh for members to understand the parameters uh and of course those sort of those timelines uh yes. for when we can expect to to uh set our own deadlines as well internally uh for You're right. planning purposes Mr. York. Yes, so we, we do, do have, I do have some stuff that I can send. I know it was it was a ton of detail and a very, very fast speaking. So I apologize for that. Um, we do have some resources like on our website and stuff that I can send to Amanda to distribute um, to all of you so that you have something written in front of you uh, with the timeline on it. Um, like I said, the, the, the big bead program, which is by far the largest amount uh, of broadband funding, and it just happens to go directly to the states. It's probably looking at towards the end of this year, maybe early next year. It really just depends on when the FCC can get their can get the new broadband maps done. Uh, but I do have resources that uh, I will send over to, to Amanda to distribute for all of you, um, as well as you know, kind of projected timelines. Um, and then the one thing I did want to mention that I should have mentioned earlier, and this is for everyone that I can also send the link to Amanda, is that we are actually, NCSL is hosting a uh, broadband briefing with NTIA um, on Thursday, February 17th. So that's, I think it's two weeks from today, exactly. Um, and so we have, uh, it's at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We have a Zoom link for it. Um, they are still trying to figure out exactly who it will be. I think it'll either be the chief of staff of NTIA or their associate director. Of, they have like an office of connectivity and something or another. And, and I think they may be a speaker. And so they're gonna give kind of a high level overview like I did of the various programs, but then there's gonna be a discussion portion of it uh, where obviously we will be able to, or legislators and legislative staff will be able to ask them questions. And then they actually really do want some feedback directly from the legislators on, um, you know, how they can best structure and implement the guidance to make the program most effective and impactful, you know, when that Zoom link, it does require you to register, um, but I'll forward that Zoom link to Amanda as well. And any, um, any legislators or legislative staff who are interested in joining that briefing, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. We're, we're keeping it just to legislators and legislative staff, but uh, obviously anyone on this call, I believe, uh, would be more than welcome to join. So I did want to throw that out there, uh, and that should also be pretty enlightening. Thank you. Representative Bonner, further questions? Uh, yeah, two quick things, uh, just um, briefly. Um, I will say in terms of the administration piece, I, I am glad that, that that topic came up and was addressed. Uh, certainly, I think we all agree that we want more of the money to go towards our mission and less on administration. 
um, my understanding uh, from previous projects is that Minnesota is pretty tight about that control as well and making sure that we do that. So, I, and I have no doubt with folks like Representative Nash uh, on the job that we will make sure that we adhere to that. So I feel confident about that. Um, also, in terms of some of the questions that Representative Quam asked, um, I do sit on the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity uh, and, and serve as the Vice Chair. And I can tell you that one of the hot topics at this present moment is how we address issues of uh, security and confidentiality. Um, to your point, Representative Quam, um, we've been uh, having conversations about secure meetings um, to make sure that when we have conversations about these topics that we are not giving an opportunity uh, to folks who should not have that information. And I would expect that this will be not only a hot topic, but one that the LCC will very likely take up in helping guide the state and working with our partners at Minute, our state agencies, our local agencies, et cetera. Um, so uh, more, more to come on that, but just wanted to make sure that folks who may not be aware of the new parameters around the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity, that we do have some exceptional folks on that in that group. Uh, obviously, Representative Elkins, Representative Nash, Representative Lutero, Senators Wicklin, Coran, and Fate, for example, all sit on that commission. Uh, so we, uh, we are very blessed to have a good plethora of folks who, who get the stakes and who will be looking over our shoulder, more or less, to make sure that we follow those guidelines. Um, Ms. Frederick. Yeah, I, so while while you all were talking, I reached out to the agency. Uh, and with respect to confidentiality, uh, they will, FEMA is working to develop a specific grant related um, portal, if you will, that will be, will have security enhancements. The information that the state submits to the agency will not be public information. It will not be able to be viewed by the public. They, um, I'm, they are not clear on whether what there will be a security clearance requirement per se, but they will look into that. I mean, that's not something that anybody has raised with them. So thank you for raising it. Um, but they do, they do assume at this point, or they want to make sure that the information that a state submits will not be available to the public. So hopefully that will mean that it will not be available to bad actors either. Any further questions? I don't see any hands jumping up. Well, thank you, um, Ms. Frederick, Mr. York, for your presentation. Um, and uh, this gives us a lot to chew on and uh, and it's, it's good to know what's coming down the pike that we're gonna probably have to be working on it as we go forward in the future. Um, um, and with that, um, I guess that's, the end of our your presentation. And if you can get send that information that we requested, that that would be great. That we can then uh, Amanda that can get it out to the rest of the committee. Uh, Representative Bonner, you have your hand up again. I do, and I'm sorry I failed to mention one thing. Um, and and I just wanted to put this in perspective. I know that um, you know the the folks in in the IT world we get all excited and geeky about these kind of things, but for, for ordinary members on this committee, I, I just want to say um, that this actually represents a really incredible opportunity for our state to really get down uh, and fortify some of our um, assets, uh, even down to or a granular, more granular level. Um, we are only as strong as our weakest, our weakest link, um, and so. I, I do realize that there are some matching requirements, but I want to, you know, flag that for folks that this is really an incredible opportunity for our state, um, and I hope that members will uh, continue to follow this topic and be supportive. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative Bonner. Uh, Representative Elkins, you're muted. Yeah, I'm mute. Okay. 
So um, I think for um, Representative Bonner, Representative Nash, uh, um, the members of the Cybersecurity uh, Committee, and I, I noticed that uh, Rohit Tandon and uh, Brendan Hirsch are on, on the meeting as well. But I think one of the things I'm noticing from this presentation is that a, a lot of these different grant programs are going to come at what will for us kind of be awkward times uh, during our, our budget cycle. And uh, so I think we'll, we'll probably need to work uh, pretty closely with uh, you know, Minnesota IT services to figure out you know, how do we you know, integrate these grant programs into our um, into our budget process over the course of the next two years. That's a good point. Um, any other comments before we before we adjourn? Again, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Trey, for the for the information, and uh, look forward to more to more discussion on this. And like I said, this would be something that's important to all of us um, going forward. And with that, members, um, our next meeting is Tuesday, uh, February 8th, and we'll be taking up presentations on the governor's supplemental budget requests from MMB, admin, Minnesota IT, and the Board of Accounting. So um, look forward to that. Uh, there are no further questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, but if there are no further questions, members, thank you all for taking the time this morning. And from that, we are adjourned.